Welcome back to the Friday 13th YouTube channel, Metalheads. Today I've got a fantastic interview for you to check out. Now, I've just interviewed Jake and also Joseph from the band With and Fall. The band are about to release their new album, which is absolutely phenomenal. It's called Sounds of the Forgotten on Death Wave Records. Now, I'd like to thank Joseph and also Jake for doing this interview. Much appreciated, guys. And I'd also like to thank people for watching this. So please leave comments, share, and share on social media. Give a thumbs up and also subscribe. Thanks for watching, Metal Ed. Be safe. My interview is coming soon. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how are you doing? I'm all right. All right. Your background is quite interesting. Yeah, well, it's going to get better, yeah, guys. Background. It's, it's going to get better. <laughs> so I want to thank you guys. We're talking to the guys from Winterfall. We're talking to Jake and also Joseph. So first of all, I want to thank you for doing this interview. And your new album, by the way, is absolutely fucking fantastic. Thank you. Thank uh, I don't know if you've seen the review today, Joseph. I give it five out of five. I, I did. I I I, uh, I liked your, your YouTube video. Thank you very much, my friend. So I'm going to ask you some warm-up questions first, because this is the first interview with you guys. So, um, Jake, what, as a guitarist, who's, who's inspired you and what age did you learn to play guitar? <laughs> wow. Uh, well, at the beginning, it was... Well, the first person that I really, like, looked up to, and he wasn't a guitar player, but was Gene Simmons from Kiss when I was, like, four... Um, but then as a guitar player, Angus Young was the first one. The uh, intro to Hell's Bells is what made me want to play guitar, that arpeggiated figure, which is Malcolm. Um, then Slash, and then like I got into some of the heavier stuff. By heavy, I mean like Megadeth and Metallica and Maiden, and then um, and then Ingve. And then when I heard Ingve, that was that was it for like just wanting to practice all day and and try to get you know cop his his Swedish feel. So yeah, it's, I think those guys are like the ones that really, really kind of, when I was a kid, got me, I, I got bit by the bug by all three of those guys, three okay. or four. So, what, so what's your first guitar you have and do you still own it? My first guitar, I think it was like, uh, it was a miniature, um, like, God, it wasn't, a, it was, it was like a knockoff Taylor. So, but it was one that was used because my first guitar teacher wanted me to like um learn on the acoustic which was just boring and painful as hell and very uninspiring and you're trying to learn you know you want to play acdc but you're you're having to learn all these songs on these chords and the action was super super high so um but no i don't own that one and then eventually i got like um my, my dad gave me his his cream les paul which i have over here that was probably my first real guitar that that was gifted to me and um it was it was pretty cool. Pretty sure it was stolen from like 1989 because I think he got a good deal on it at a pawn shop. Okay, then, so Joseph, what about you as a singer? Then, who, who inspired you to become a singer? I actually started off as a guitarist. I I didn't really take singing seriously until I was in my like mid twenties, late twenties. Okay, so who inspired you as a vocalist and guitar player then? I mean, probably the same as Jake. We both love Slash and Ingve and, and uh, Andy the Rock. We both came from like a hard rock background and then got into like classical music and, and you know, the, the neoclassical movement. But yeah, I, I don't know, man. Like, that's a tough call. Like, as a singer, like I, I just, I just wanted to write songs, like, and and I could never find a way, could never find someone that could bring those songs to life. And that's why I, you know, I just kind of turned my focus from, from playing guitar to to learning voice and and building the instrument, so that you know I could just do that myself, and not have to rely on, you know, the unreliable lead vocalists out there that don't play any instruments. Right then. So who's inspired you as a singer then? Who's your, who's your influences? Who's inspired you? I mean, like the obvious ones, but for different reasons. Uh, like Sebastian Bach was an early one. Uh, Steven Tyler, early one. I mean, Bon Jovi was huge for me, like back in my formative years. Um, Paul Wilkinson, the the Irish tenor, the first uh, Jean Valjean in uh, in Les Misérables. Uh, for metal, like I always liked the really 
interesting, like unique singers like King Diamond and, and you know Zach Stevens. You know, people that are doing something a little different than just trying to mimic like Priest or Hetfield, you know. Right. Okay. That's interesting to know. I mean, your influences that you've just said really don't seem to fit in with Within Falls music, does it? It's completely different to what you guys have just told me. I don't know. Like, take a deeper listen into some of the vocals. Like, you'll you'll catch some R and B influences in there too. I'll have to listen to the new album again and see if I can hear some Bon Jovi. <laughs> oh yeah, 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 absolutely. So, what bands were you guys in before Within Falls got together? What band was you in, Jake and you, Joseph? What was you in before? We were in the same band. Yeah, we were in the same band. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, actually, we actually formed Witherfall because you were telling us you were in Leeds. We were in Lime Region. Oh, you were Leeds. Okay. Yeah, tell us story, Jake. Yeah, we were in a band called White Wizard back in 2013. Um, it, is in you know, it fell uh, fell apart on this disastrous, horrendous tour, which was in the UK, and then we um. We were on a beach in Lyme Regis smoking cigars and um, we're just like, God, this we got we to gotta form something that that where we can write our own songs and and do it in a way that's going to make us interested and fulfilled, which is like, you know, Witherfall has so many different different influences and different sounds. So um, but yeah, we were in Lyme Regis. So it was White Wizard. And then Joseph and I were like, when we get back to the States, let's uh, let's get together and and uh and write some stuff together and see what happens so yeah so we actually both came from the same band <laughs> interesting so with and for who came up with the name and what does it mean to the people that are not familiar with the name so we were tossing ideas back and forth um and uh with and for was just the one that that ended up sticking like we had a couple of names that that didn't work out that our our drummer adam that passed away absolutely yeah, rest in peace yeah, exactly. I just talked to his brothers, Jake. Oh, really? I'll, I'll, Fagan brothers. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll fill you in. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's ironically or unironically, it, it it's a name that's quite literally like the process of living and dying, like like leaves from a tree. They wither and then they fall. Right, very interesting that you've come up with that name. So, I mean, your first album, Nocturnus and Requiem, is a brilliant album. You put it out yourselves, I believe, officially, didn't you? It was like a self-finance thing. Yeah. I mean, that is such a unique album. When I first heard your band, it kind of reminded me of Sanctuary, Nevermore, Psychotic Waltz, Evergrace, Evergrace, Symphony X. Do you kind of agree with me with them influences? They're not direct, but I can hear what you're saying. On yeah, a lot definitely. Of it. Yeah, um, definitely. Yeah, like yeah, it, saying a lot of our stuff is kind of like probably listening to the same people as those guys, you know? So I think we wanted think to do something that was a little bit different. We came from at least, at least where I was coming from, like it, a lot of the, the bands that we were kind of in were you had to, you, there was, there was a, some strict rules you had to apply by. It seemed like when it came to songwriting, which I just, I hated, you know, it was like you could have a cool, you could have something really cool, but it was going to get tossed out because it didn't fit under a certain mold. And that just always seemed so creatively just dumb, you know, like it, you, you couldn't, you can't express yourself that way. So we really wanted to do something that was just all of our ideas that we wanted to hear in a band and, and put it out there. And I think above all, it's something that is like, we, I, I just remember Nocturnes and Requiems being super happy with it when we finally got the the final master back and being like, this is a record I would want to listen to. Like, these are the songs that, like, if I heard this, I'd be happy with it. I'd be like, I oh, got to check these guys out. And I think that was kind of our, uh, at least for me, that was like what I wanted from day one, you know? Yeah, and I mean, when, when, when I first did the first album, two bands that, two bands that sprung to mind were Sarkosic Walls and Nevermore. I think there's something about the Sarkosic Walls influences in there. I don't know if you guys agree. Like the first, never, I never, I never, never listened. listened. Yeah, I never listened to Psychotic Waltz. No. Wow, listen to a healthy yeah. dose of Nevermore. That's for sure, though. Yeah, I, I barely, I barely listened to Nevermore uh, when I met Jake. Like I had, I had the first Nevermore. Uh, uh, what is it, an EP or whatever it was? Nevermore, yeah. Nevermore. Yeah. Uh, I had that on a burned uh, cassette tape, like that some college kid gave me, and that's it. That's all I knew of Nevermore. 
I didn't know any Nevermore when I met Jake. I was more into like King Diamond and stuff like that. Um, I think I think that for me, when I listened back to that record, like the writing process was was so crazy and involved between like Jake and I and and to a lesser extent Adam when we were doing some of the arrangements. That that's all I can think about when I hear that. It's like, oh my god, I can. Like I have them here, but our like charts where we were charting out everything is is so OCD and meticulous. Like, and that kind of informs the way that that we write. Like we write like we're like composing a score. Like we're not like a band that goes in somewhere and jams or you know, like flips each other right like riff ideas. Like we're literally like creating this big score of, you know, heavy metal, rock, you know, madness. But that that first time where we didn't really know what to expect when we were writing together for Nocturnes, it was so uh, emblematic of like how the whole thing would end up like evolving. But I just I still remember all of us pouring over that fucking those yellow legal pads, like writing yeah. out each measure and what key and what time signature it was in, and and like me having to go into fucking Pro Tools to get the click tracks just right and fucking retarding the fucking thing with like with an automation plugin. Like, yeah, that was that, that was great. Was, <laughs> yeah, that was that was like the first that was the only time really that we ever actually worked with uh, with a drummer on the arrangements because um, every record after that it's always just been Joseph and Joseph and myself doing putting everything down and then eventually you know our, our self admittedly our, our our writing process and recording is a bit frustrating to other people besides joseph and and i but oh well too bad that's what happens and that's where you get a check but yeah. but like that was i remember we were working on songs with uh with a drummer in the room which was which was really cool and that was with adam and it, it really hasn't happened at all since then you know um, it was an attempt it was an attempt yeah <laughs> so, but uh but yeah that was yeah, th thinking back to making that record, that was um, and, and originally actually, Nocturnes and Requiems was supposed to be an EP. You know, it was, but it, it became you know forty five minutes or however long it is. It's it's almost it's yeah, forty seven, I think. You know, did it sell well? Like, did it sell well for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. well enough where the label wanted to come steal it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, yeah. the next album you did, I mean, you did this album, um, a Palooza, to Palooza Sorrow, because this is when you signed to Century Media Records. How did the deal with Century Media come about? Uh, well, that one, well, they actually, they heard, I think through, when I got into Iced Earth, I think that put a little bit of um, eyes on the band a little bit. And John had a good relationship with Philip, uh, that's the head of the label. And um, I think he had seen like we we got in a lot of like German magazines for like best demo of the year or something. I can't remember something like that. And I think that put some eyes on on it. And um, I remember I was in I was in on vacation in China when Schaefer wrote me and said, "Hey, can he give uh, my email address to Philip?" And then Philip pretty much just wrote us, you know, it's like, hey, let's let's we're really interested. Let's put out um, Nocturne's um, re-release, I think, and, and maybe like a European release, I think, with it. Yeah. We, yeah. We, we kept the U.S. rights. Yeah. So that's that was that was how we got with that. You know, of course, there's a longer story with like, you know, getting the contract and all that stuff. But um, we we had other offers before that that just were embarrassing. It, 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 they, those people should be ashamed of themselves for even like sending those offers. Yeah, I remember we had we were really like we we waited on Nocturnes for a while because in our head it was like we wanted to have a label to get out with it. And I remember we had an industry page that we were sending and in real time you could see who was all listening to your stuff and and yeah, we also had some feedback from people that are no longer in the business that were like, yeah. <laughs> I don't think this is going to do anything for you guys. And it's like, well, we have the last laugh, you know? <laughs> I love right. stories. But... So did this album sell well for you? 
back back when it was Simon Central Media. Are you talking about Nocturnes or Prelude? And you have uh, the P- Prelude of there. Sorrow. Oh, Prelude. Prelude Sorrow. Yeah, Prelude came. Uh, that was like a year after we we re released Nocturnes, um, and that one. I mean, there's a whole story around that because Prelude to Sorrow, the name of it. Um, is an acronym for Adam Paul Sagan, and that's the drummer who died. So that yeah. record um, has a has that theme going throughout. And I, I still, it's been a, it's been, we have some tours coming up, so I've been relearn relearning and rehearsing these songs. And when you listen back to that record, it is sorrow sounding, <laughs> you know. Also, Jeez. making that record that we could do a whole documentary on that because that was a very painful process. I Can think I, I had. I had joined Sanctuary. Jake and I toured uh, right before that record, right before we went in and recorded. Right. That was yeah. 2018. The World Dane tribute tour opening for... Yeah, I right. mean, we, we met at Headbangers, Op- uh, Bang- Headbangers Open Air Festival, Joseph. If you remember when he was singing for uh, Sanctuary that day. Oh, okay. All right. That, that was a blur, man. Yeah. Um, I, was, I think that's where I met Todd Latour. Um, yeah, you did. Like, it was yeah, you guys and Queens right and Hellstar and some other great bands yeah. playing that day. Yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a fun festival. Like it felt like you were in the woods and you were like, like on stage, you you were like peeling back like all the like foliage to like the crowd. <laughs> for me, really for good. me, it was somebody's back garden with a little stage. It's just an amazing little festival. I mean, yeah, little, but compared to you know, most of the fucking shows, Sanctuary played that year. It wasn't very little. <laughs> Alcatraz was the only bigger one right so the album Pollute to Sorrow was a very dark album for you guys very emotional yeah yeah like all that screaming like at the end is like it's real like I locked myself in a room with a computer and some microphones and had at it, it was, uh, I mean okay. besides yeah it was just like the writing of the of the, of the record was was pretty good i mean there was definitely like you know very dark subjects but the production of making that record we did it at and the guy that that the studio that <laughs> owner of the studio and, and then he kind of did some engineering on it but he was just uh he was going through his own prelude to sorrow which is true because he ended up dying uh you know a year after that wow. um and it was it was just a really chaotic time. There was, uh, you know, the drummer that we originally had on it. He couldn't do it. We had to fly in Garago, um, from Greece. <laughs> it was just fucking. It's amazing that record even exists. You know, the studio blew away. The studio doesn't even exist anymore. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> Which is- and they all blew away. It's like kind of like a nod to that on, on Curse, like. Yeah, it was down in my hometown of Panama City, Florida, and Hurricane Michael came in almost right after we were finished in 2018. And, um, yeah, Category 5 hurricane. And uh, Lucky lucky I flew down there and got the fucking Masters before that happened. Yeah, no shit, man. (laughs) Yeah, it was, that was a, that, that was a crazy, crazy time, crazy summer. Wow. I mean, the next thing you did was the EP, Vintage. I mean, you got two covers on there. You got Halloween, Tell What I Wasn't Right, and you've done the Tom Petty song, I Walk, I Walk Back Down. I mean, why did you just have to do those two songs as covers? Well, we had done them uh, during the prelude sessions in that studio. And, uh, you know, the, the label was like, let's just save this. You have this acoustic tour coming up with Sonata Arctica. Let's let's record a few acoustic versions of some songs and put the covers on it and make it an EP. Um, yeah, that that's basically the story behind that one. And also, the song "Vintage" on the Prelude to Sorrow didn't really get that much of a push, so like we were kind of sad about that. And having the EP being "Vintage" and putting "Vintage" on as the last song was kind of like our effort to to get it some more some more eyes and ears but you know the way that spotify and, and those streaming services work once you have that isrc attached to it it really doesn't push it out again like it's it's considered a song that's already already released like we'd have to do something else to, with it. okay something yeah but I mean, it sold well it sold out it was 
It was uh, the digit packs were limited and totally sold out. I think we have like six left. It's very expensive to buy on eBay that EP. Well, because there's none left. Right. Yeah. Supply and demand. It was <laughs> two uh... two thousand limited, and then the all the vinyls were limited except for the black vinyl, and I think that's the only thing we have. Like, yeah, six copies of the vintage EP uh, digit pack, and like, you know, maybe ten black vinyls here. I don't know what they have to stop over there. There's nothing left. Okay. Yeah, that's very very rare. Especially we had a green. Um, yeah, that's gone. Green vinyl and then like a, a, a bear decree. Yeah. And yeah. and those were those sold out, you know, probably within that tour that we did. And we also did a, a reworked version of vintage um, yeah. acoustic arrangement of it and uh kind of a medley thing. And we had to do that. We got called up by Century to do to do that EP and have it finished before um the Sonata tour, which was in March of that of 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 2019 so we were oh, working yeah. we did it right before we went to japan we went there literally fucking shut the pro tools unit down and had to get to lax to get on a flight to japan <laughs> to, to do a tour or uh, you know well uh, two shows with camelot in japan but that was uh yeah that was that was another interesting one so um Dude. and it's cool because like tom petty cover was like totally just out of nowhere we were working on the song shadows off of prelude at joseph studio in vegas and it was probably 4 a.m and we <laughs> fucked up from just you know a couple days in vegas of writing and and had some wine and um just kind of came up with this arrangement of it and uh it was really cool i, I still think that's a pretty cool cover I mean, yeah. the next song, I mean, the next song that you did, you did the Boston song, Long Time, but I've, I've heard the original version, and your version's a lot slower and a lot different. Why did you decide to do your own intake of that song? That's just what we do. We like to fuck around with classic rock songs. I guess it's a bit like Nevermore when they did uh, Love Bites by Judas Priest. They fucked that up as well, but it sounded so weird. <laughs> I don't think I've I mean, heard that. I, I mean, I think with like a song like, like long, well, Foreplay, Long Time, which I, I wish was how they would came up on YouTube. That's a whole other conversation. Um, but like you, you have a song like that, that here on American radio, you'll hear it at least if you're on a, if you're on a two hour car ride, you'll hear it at least twice, you know, yeah. So that yeah. song is, is in it. And it's, it was done as far as I'm concerned, perfect. The first time, how can you like redo that, you know? And, and we plus, yeah, I think we tried like making it a little bit quote unquote heavier. And we're like, this isn't working. It's too much of a majory kind of attitude. So we love to mess around with the harmony. And we came up with an acoustic arrangement to it, which uh I think really <laughs> makes the lyrics poke out more, you know? It makes it much darker. It is right. a sad if you if you just read it as as poetry, it's very sad and then I was like, this is like, we're like singing Brad Delp's like sad song back to him after he killed himself. Right. Okay. So, I mean, the next album you did was um, Curse of Autumn, a very dark cover, this very complex. Was this a good seller for you? Because you guys seem to write really dark music. Yeah, Curse probably performed the best um, sales-wise, especially in Germany. Um, so, and that one, that one was like, yeah, we had Schaefer that produced it. So he, co yeah, co-produced it. And, uh, we did it at his stu. We did it. We did the drums during COVID in LA and we did a lot of, we did a lot of the production in um, at Schaefer studio in Indiana and then mixed it, um, at more sound. So Believe it or not, and actually way easier process even during COVID than Prelude to Sorrow. Okay, then, so, so why did you guys ah. leave Century Media? What was the reason? Any reasons? They just, uh, it just the the functions that a label fulfills, and we can leave out whether they do them well or not because it just depends. Uh, there's nothing there that we can't do ourselves. The people that were doing a great job for us 
we could hire those people and we, we did. We hired the same PR team in Europe uh, that we always used when we were with Centra Media. And it just, it comes down to, to, to economics and stress load. It's like a lot of the things that, that like say I have to do now, like I still had to oversee and make sure those things were done right. Cause there were so many balls that were dropped, you know, like, so it's like, you might as well just do them yourself and take all of the revenue. Like, why are we sharing revenue? You know, they're not really putting in anything at all. Right. I mean, we were making records that were, they would give us the budget, but we'd always go way over on our own dime because there is a certain quality level that we're, we're just not, we're not going to put something out that's like not to our standards. No. And you put that into it, it's like, you know, when you do with the breakdown, you have to sell sh shit, triple, you know, what you would think. Five. Five, yeah, five times just to get what, you know, what we get back. And, um, and yeah, I, I, I think that, I mean, there are guys at Century Media that we, that we really liked and, and still do respect. Um, and you know, they were nice to us, but, uh, yeah, there was, it, it's been, we get the same thing, you know, by doing it this way than we were a Century. And it was also like, you know, we, we like that control and maybe too much control to some people. And then, you know, it's just nice not to get like yelled at for <laughs> wanting your product to be as best as it can be that's not fair yeah yeah it, it just i'll give one example the the record you're talking about curse of autumn it it was uh it charted at number 83 for the first week in the united states it was right next to miley cyrus's uh plastic cards record log on to billboard pro oh there's no album cover for our record. There's just a big fucking question mark because the label forgot to submit the artwork along with all the metadata, right? So it's like, why why are we sacrificing eighty percent of the revenue for them to fuck up when it's we're just as stressed out and have to do just as much work anyway to make sure they don't do stuff like that? We might as well just take care of it ourselves. Yeah, and then if we would like ask them about it, they would get mad at us. Yeah, they'd say we did something wrong. Yeah, that's weird because yeah. I mean, you've set up your own label now with Death Wave Records. So, you, like you said, you cut everything out, you own everything. Is this the way yeah. to go for a lot of bands? Do you think if if they know how to do this stuff, I mean, like if you know a little bit about copyright and trademark law and how to how to navigate like all of the you know all of the the PROs and Sound Exchange and the MCL and like you know if if you know. A little bit about business then yeah you could probably do it if you have funding you know like i mean bigger bands don't need as much like you know like like john when he wanted to go independent he could announce a record drop a record and, and be you know in the black within a week right like it's not that big a deal but for a new band you know like the label can be useful like if you don't have a, an external source of funding you know just to go in the studio because right. you gotta make you gotta make a good product, like you know, like this whole laptop fantasy that everyone has, thinking they can make a classic record on a laptop and a hundred dollar interface is fucking bullshit. It's bullets. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna talk about the new album then. Uh, um, Sounds of the Forgotten. Who came up with the title? Did you have any other titles? It's the same story. Like you know, like we're all just kind of Jake and I are just sitting there usually drinking and uh throwing back and forth like words that kind of fit the mood of what's going on uh, i think we were talking about we always talk about water and like musical terminology and then somehow we drop the musical terminology for this one right so yeah, i mean I think it sounds is like a body of water which is what we wanted to showcase in the artwork and we were we came up with that title. It eerily looks exactly like what the artist came up with, um, yeah. which is very, very bizarre. But but also yeah, well, <laughs> crazy. Like how how that looks just like Jake's backyard. So yeah. who, who did the artwork for the albums? Is he has his artist done all the previous albums? No, no. no. He, 
he went MIA, uh, I think, from what I've seen since last time I talked to Christian, is that he's concentrating more on uh, monetizing his past work. Like, it's probably more profitable for him to take all of his records and travel around to all the, the you know, the art galleries and, and do shows than it is for him to, you know, he he's so meticulous painting these fucking things it takes him three months to do one so he can do four a year and they're not they're expensive for what most people would consider to pay for an album cover but for producing four of something a year they're not that expensive so i i think he's he's focusing less on doing newer stuff and more on like you know bringing his catalog around so so yeah, how would you would, so, but, but the guy that we used on this record was blake armstrong who he's done uh, in flames. Um, I, th I think he's done some work with uh, Megadeth recently, not for an album art, but for like some of their promos. Right. And right. He does, a, he does quite a bit of stuff in the, the film world. He does um, Harry Potter and Wednesday, the, the show Wednesday. And he came up with that freaking album cover. And I mean, it was ridiculous how quick a time, like, <laughs> Two days and we got that and i don't think i think it's been one of the only things we've almost just first passed have said yeah this is this is great um and and nothing to not christian either i'm a huge fan of christian's work and and uh i remember when we were on that sonata tour it was like a big privilege i don't think christian meets a lot of his bands but he came he traveled to uh malmo um to see us and we hung out in the we were in malmo and we hung out in the Irish sports bar. I remember that. It was hilarious. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so no, we have, we have memories. But yeah, but Blake Armstrong was the one who did um who did this who did Sounds of the Forgotten and and really, really knocked out of the park. I think the coloring of it is is fantastic and I think it really showcases. And again, every time I look at it, I'm like, how the hell it's it's like he took a snapshot of Joseph and I there, because there there was a full moon, which again is, you know, huge. Yeah. It was